So my throat is still a little scratchy, and I thought, you know, I need something, um, that's not a very good setup. I need something hot for my voice. So I went out there for the hot water, and um, uh, the button wasn't pushed, so it didn't get hot. <laughs> you got to push that button. <laughs> I know I did that too. And uh, so I'm trying coffee, and I don't drink coffee, but oh, a couple of swallows of coffee surviving there. Very good. I don't know if the fonts got loaded or not. Did they not get loaded? Huh? Hope so. Okay. They're not showing up there, so that would be interesting. Okay. <clears throat> this might be a little off on the screen again this morning. We'll see how that looks. Very good. We're going to start a new series here um, talking about the church. Um, but I want to start out this morning talking about uh, safe spaces. How many of you know what a safe space is? Have you heard about them in the news in the past probably year or two? They've been really uh, kind of uh, popular. Safe spaces, and we see them today primarily on college campuses. Here's a definition of a safe space from the Oxford (coughs) Dictionary. A safe space is a place or environment in which a person or category of people can feel confident that they will not be exposed to discrimination, criticism, harassment, or any other emotional or physical harm. While these spaces are nothing new, their presence has become more common across the USA, primarily on college campuses. Um, That's the Oxford Dictionary. The idea behind a safe space is so that no one, if you're in this place, you can't be offended. And uh, there's two really competing responses to that. There are those who think they deserve a safe space and they need a safe space on their college campus or in their town or maybe in their home, I don't know. And then um, <clears throat> there are those that kind of laugh at people that need safe spaces and kind of think it's humorous and uh, kind of almost make fun of those that need safe spaces. And they feel that as a country, we are too easily offended and too politically correct. I don't know if we should make fun of those people that want a safe space, but I do think we should maybe feel sorry for them. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, We'll talk about that this morning. Here's the question this morning. Um, today's question really is this. Is our safe space is biblical? And when it comes to the church, should the church be a safe space? Now, I can ask that question and, and uh, if we don't give it much thought, we can immediately come to one of two conclusions. Yes, the church should be a safe space. No, the church wouldn't be a safe space. Um, we're going to talk about that today and kind of unpack that question a little bit as we go through this message today. Here's the thing. We're, we're in a new series for a new year and we're going to be talking about the church. What is the church? And uh, <clears throat> what I've done is I've come up with a number of words that will describe really what the church should be. Words like truth, grace, life, mission, Um, incomplete, authentic, one, righteousness, service, gifts, worship, and Christ. All those words, we'll kind of take them in the next several weeks and we'll look at what the church is. Now, one of the goals of this, I guess, of of this series, um, one of the goals is that we're driving to this thing. We're going to have a membership Sunday. Um, Some of you here maybe became members of the church 20 years ago. I don't know when the last time was the church did a membership a Sunday, been here 13 years, we never did one, and I don't think before that there were any membership Sundays uh, for some time. And so we were looking recently, as, as the leadership kind of said, well, who's an official member, you know, when it comes to different things? And so um, we're going to just have a Sunday when if you want to join the church, you can become a member, and uh, we'll talk about that more as this goes forward. One of the things when we think about membership here, I, I, I think this is pretty safe to say that you know, um, really the only requirement to be a member here really ultimately is that you know Christ as your Savior, that you're a member of God's church. If you're a member of God's, of God's church, then you can get involved here and, um, and we'll talk more about that again. But uh, it's interesting because there are some churches where it's easier to get into God's church and into God's family than it is to get into the, the local church because they have all these things that you gotta, uh, hoops you gotta jump through and you gotta... Uh, do all these things to become a member. That's, of course, certainly not the case here. If you know Christ and uh, if you'll help us with our mission here and you'll protect the unity of our church, um, I'm sure you can get involved here and be a part of what God is doing. And so we're excited about that. Now, what I want to do today 
is something I did the last couple of years, and I'm going to go to the caption of our church. I heard a pastor one time say that every year he preached the same message to his church. I don't know if that just meant he took a Sunday off and just did the exact same message every year or what. Um, That's not what I'm doing here. But um, I thought that was a kind of an interesting idea, and so each year I'm trying to go back to the same kind of basic outline and kind of work through some of these basic truths. And so for the next two Sundays, we're going to be talking again about the caption of our church, which is uncompromising truth plus radical grace equals abundant life. And we kind of caption our church with that, those three things, uncompromising truth, radical grace, abundant life. We want people, the end result is for people to know the abundant life of Christ and uh, we believe you, you know that when you have uncompromising truth and when you have radical grace that come together. And so that's what we're going to talk about this Sunday and then next. And... Um, we're, we're going to talk today about what, I'm, what I've entitled the messy middle. The messy middle, that, that place in between truth and grace that is so difficult to navigate. And so here's today's big idea. It kind of defines the messy middle. It's that place that exists between truth and grace where we desperate, where we deliberately, excuse me, engage lives that are broken and people who are hurting, sharing with them the uncompromising word of God. And so we have this uncompromising truth over here we believe of God's word and yet we have the reality of people's lives that are so broken and so messed up and at times our lives are over here and we need the radical grace of God to come in and meet us where we are and minister to us. And and how do you navigate that? It's so difficult sometimes to navigate that. We'll talk about that a little bit today and um, we'll talk about safe spaces and we'll talk about uncompromising truth and radical grace and abundant life. Now let me start here. This is an, I've kind of used this illustration before, but it is so fitting here, okay? So let's say that you go to your mechanic and, and, and you're looking to buy this brand new car, right? You go to your mechanic and say, hey, I want to buy this car. I love this car. I'm searching forever. And what do you think of it? And he looks the car over and says, hey, it's a great car. And uh, so you go out and you spend the thousands of dollars and buy this car. And the next day... The brakes go out and then the transmission fails and you're like, what's up with that, you know? Or you, say you go to your doctor and you go to your doctor and you say, I've been feeling well, I just, I'm just curious, you know, can you look me over and tell me how I'm doing? And he runs a bunch of tests, comes back and says, hey, you know what? I think you look great. You're in perfect health, wouldn't worry about it. And then the next day you go out and you're at the mall and you have a heart attack. <laughs> and you're like, hey, what's up with that? So you go to your mechanic and you go to your doctor and you say, hey, what's up with that? You told me this car was great and, and it had all these problems. And the mechanic's like, well, yeah, well, I didn't want you to feel bad. You really like the car. I didn't want to offend you. You know, I, I want my shop to be a safe space. Or you go to your doctor and he says the same thing. Well, I, you know, I, I didn't want you to feel bad by telling you the truth. I, you know, I wanted my office to be a safe space. And... Um, you're like, hey, well, that's, sorry, but that's not, when we go to the doctor, we go to the mechanic, we don't want a safe space. We want the truth. What is the truth about my car? What is the truth about my health? We don't want to spend thousands of dollars or risk a heart attack. Last week, we referenced back to that story. Remember the story of the rich man who came to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And, and, and Jesus uh, told him what he had to do. He had to sell all he had and come and follow him. <clears throat> but I'm, I, I'm just struck in that context. Remember what it said in there. It said Jesus, loving the man, told him. The, the point is Jesus loved the man enough to tell him the truth. You really want eternal life? You, you really want to know me more deeply, more intimately? You really want what's missing in your life? Here's what you have to do. It's different for everybody. What you have to do, you're a rich man. All this wealth is standing between you and knowing me more deeply. So sell it all and come and follow me and you'll have everything you want. And he loved the man enough to tell him the truth. This morning, I want us to consider our responsibility to the truth. I want us to specifically talk about embracing the tension between truth and grace, about meeting people in the messy middle that is their lives and answering the questions as to whether or not the church should be a safe space. Now, talking about the truth, <clears throat> let's deal with the, one of the most glaring truths up front. Most of us in this room don't like messy things, do you? How about you got that baby or that toddler? How many love a messy diaper? <laughs> right? 
Or how about that toddler that's two or three or four and they like to take that messy diaper and paint with it on the walls. You ever seen that happen before? You, anybody like that? You like messy things? How about when your uh, sewer system backs up and your toilet backs up all over your house? And you, how many like messy things? Or maybe even worse, you, you were in Texas this past summer for Hurricane Harvey and it came through and ravaged your home and took everything out and left you with nothing but a pile of a mess to clean up. We don't like messy things. But the reality is, being Christ's body, being the church, we are called to get involved in the messy lives of people, to embrace that tension between truth and grace. Next week we'll talk more about God's radical grace. This morning we want to focus on His uncompromising truth. So here's uh, five things this morning that we need to know about God's uncompromising truth truth five things we need to know and i always like to start in first timothy with this first timothy three fifteen. i have written so that you will know how people ought to act in god's household which is the church of the living god the pillar and foundation of the truth and so here's the first thing you need to know this morning about the truth it's simply this the church is to be the pillar and foundation of truth in the world that's our responsibility Not Facebook, not the evening news, no political party. No, it's the church's responsibility to be the pillar and the foundation of what truth is. And we'll be attacked for that. We will be. And the church, they'll try to silence the church. It's going to become more and more evident. But that's our responsibility. The church is to be the one place a person can always be sure they will be told The truth, Colossians chapter 2. Here's what Evan read for us earlier. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and abounding in thanksgiving. Understand that the truth will be a pillar and a foundation in your very own life. And there are people all around you whose lives are broken and are are a mess. And what happened in Hurricane Harvey, literally to their home, is just a symbolic picture of their own life. And we need the pillar and foundation of truth. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. You could substitute the word faith or truth for faith established in the faith because the word faith there is simply talking about the belief system the truths that undergird our life rooted and built up in him and established in the truth that makes up our faith a recent cover story for the economist an international magazine was entitled yes i lie to you the post-truth world The article analyzed the dishonesty that's wreaking havoc in politics, journalism, social media, and many other areas of our common life. One expert quoted in the article said, right now it pays to be outrageous, but not to be truthful. The article also highlighted one of the most effective ways to tell lies, by hiding the truth in a glut of information. Information glut is the new censorship, says Zenyep Tufshi of the University of North Carolina, adding that other governments are now employing similar tactics. China's authorities, for instance, do not try to censor everything they do not like on social media, but often flood the networks with distracting information. Similarly, in post-coup Turkey, the number of dubious posts and tweets has increased sharply. Even I can no longer really tell what is happening in parts of Turkey, says Ms. Tufshi, who was born in the country. And this is what the church is up against. One of Satan's tactics today is just, let's just throw all kinds of information out there, all kinds of disinformation out there, and just bury the truth in it. That's one of the tactics Satan uses today. The other tactic Satan uses today is he's going to hold generation of young people and telling the whole generation of young people on college campuses, you need a safe space. You should never, ever, ever be offended. You tell a whole generation of kids they should never, ever, ever be offended, you're never going to reach them with the gospel. We'll see why in just a few minutes. You know, it's really interesting. If you look closely at a lot of these safe spaces on college campuses, many times they're protecting behavior that the Bible would say is really not right, that is sinful. 
that's another, another interesting side note to a lot of these safe spaces. So the church, first of all, is to be the pillar and foundation of truth. Here is the second thing. The truth is a person. And that person is Jesus, the Christ. He is the truth. And, and this is kind of important. Uh, there's, there's, a, there, there's a reason why this is important. Go to the Gospel of John. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We know Jesus, we know Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He wasn't 50-50, he was 100% both God and man. And that's the best way to understand this. He is 100% grace, he is 100% truth. He's not 50-50, he's not grace sometimes and truth sometimes. No, he is 100% grace and truth all of the time. John 14, 6, one time his disciples were talking to him and Jesus answered a question. Jesus said to him, to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. The truth is actually a person. Now the point of these scriptures for us is that we will understand the truth best when we understand the truth is ultimately a person because Consider this, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus never changes. What does that mean about the truth? Truth never changes. What was truth a hundred years ago is truth today. What was truth a thousand years ago is truth today. What was truth 6,000 years ago when God put Adam and Eve in the garden is truth today. Truth today never changes that takes us to a third point we need to know about truth this morning and that's that the world has traded the truth for a lie and that's leading to the brokenness and messiness in people's lives the fact they've traded the truth for a lie The reality is we have a world full of broken lives, of messy lives, and it's because we have violated, we have um, uh, uh, compromised, we have ignored, we have traded the truth for a lie. Now, in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them this very basic truth. He gave all kinds of truths in the garden, but one truth was, he says, hey, there's this tree, you should never eat from this tree, the moment you eat from this tree, you will surely die. That was just a very basic truth. Now we know what happened. We know how the story goes. Adam and Eve eventually ate from the fruit of that tree, and the rest is history. I did a funeral this past Thursday, and I've done this one other time at a funeral, but I was talking to them about why we are here at this funeral, and I said we're here because of a lie that was told. What was the lie that was told? The, the lie was told by Satan back in Genesis 3. What did Satan tell Adam and Eve? You can eat that fruit. You will surely not die. That was the lie that he told them. Is that a lie or is that a lie? Just go to any funeral and look at the casket and you will see, yeah, that was a lie. We ate the fruit and we did die. We die physically, we die spiritually, we die eternally. That's the reality. So a quick recap, Adam and Eve had abundant life. They had everything they could have ever wanted. They compromised the truth and traded it for a lie and they ended up with broken and messy lives. And today it's the church's responsibility to, to reach out to people and reach into people's lives and to help them with the mess and the brokenness that is their existence today. For that to happen, we cannot compromise God's truth. We can't always be a safe space either. Sometimes the truth will offend. Here's a fourth thing we need to know about the truth, and I'll spend a little more time on this, but here's the reality. Living and accepting God's uncompromising truth can be hard. It's hard for us as believers sometimes to live out and to not compromise the truth of God's word, and it's equally hard for people that don't know Christ to accept the truth. Someone that doesn't know Christ, they have a hard time accepting the truth of God's word. So what makes the truth so difficult, so hard? Specifically, why is it hard? Why is it so hard to not compromise the truth as believers? Why do we have such a struggle with that reality? Well, let me break that down a little bit, give you a few answers to that. First, um, the world doesn't like our uncompromising approach. That's one of it. Part of the issue with uncompromising truth, it's not always the truth, it's the uncompromising part. The world doesn't like that, that we're uncompromising. 
Ask most Americans. They think that politicians and Congress should compromise more and work together more to get things accomplished to better the country. But we're not talking about taxes or we're not talking about you know, immigration or health care. We're talking about our eternal souls, our eternal life. And when it comes to our eternal souls and our eternal life, there are certain things you simply cannot compromise on. What if you're a building contractor and uh, you're building a high-rise for somebody and um, you come in to show them the work that you did and you finished and you come in and they're just really amazed. It is beautiful. They, they love what you did. The whole thing is perfect. But what they're really pleased with and surprised by is you got done like three months earlier, early and it costs like 25% less. And you're like, wow, how did you do that? And you say, well, as I was going through it, I figured I could save some money if I didn't, you know, maybe if I didn't use a strong a steel, if I didn't use as heavy a beam, you know, I could save some money. And so yeah, I kind of compromised on the foundation and on the pillars and the frame to the building. But yeah, so I saved you some money and got done earlier. How many think that that individual is going to be happy? No, you cannot compromise on some things. When it comes to the foundation, when it comes to the pillars, the supporting uh, parts of a building, you just can't compromise And we cannot compromise when it comes to our lives and to that which impacts our total and entire eternity. You know, I made this point a year ago, and yet it is powerful. I've never forgotten this point when I made it last year. Here's the thing. If the truth is a person, and it is, it is Jesus Christ, then to compromise the truth is to compromise Christ, and that is a dangerous thing to do. To compromise the truth is to compromise Christ, and to compromise Christ is to compromise the very foundation of your life. That's what the world does. They compromise Christ. They redefine him. They, they kind of change his core message. They try to make him more comfortable and less convicting. But it is imperative as the church that we do not compromise on who Christ is in any way. And this becomes a challenge though because we're all supposed to reach out and, and reach people with this radical grace How do we do that? How do we find? How do we navigate that? It is really tough. How do we keep the integrity of the truth uncompromised all while being a church with a radical grace? One of the reasons, another reason the truth can be hard kind of ties right in there. Why is the truth so hard to compromise? We don't like the tension that exists between truth and grace. We don't like the tension that exists in God's truth in general. Just just think about God's truth in general. Think about some of the tension that exists in God's truth that we really don't care for. For instance, um, here's a few examples. Um, Is Jesus human or is Jesus divine? Now I can answer that question. I don't totally understand it, but I can answer it. I can't take all the tension out of that question. Uh, I've tried to answer that for you, but... uh, that's just real. Is God one or three? Again, I can answer that, not to everyone's satisfaction. And human illustrations always fall short of really helping us fully understand how God is one and three. But is God one or is God three? Again, there is a tension that exists there. Was the Bible written by human authors or was the Bible written by God? Again, I can give you an answer, but uh, doesn't always satisfy everybody. There's a tension that exists within the realm of these things and how all this works out. How about this one? How about the free will of man versus the sovereignty of God? We, we don't like this one. This causes all kinds of debates. Some of you in this room know it causes all kinds of debates. You get into the free will of man and the sovereignty of God and, and we don't like that debate and so we try to resolve these issues sometimes in unhealthy ways. The reality is some of these things we're just never gonna be able to understand. How about the love of God, heaven, versus the justice of God, hell? Think there's a bit of a tension there? Is that that something that's maybe hard or difficult for you to navigate or to understand? Genuine question. Does anyone here struggle with the concept of hell? I'll tell you, I do. I agree with John MacArthur. John MacArthur says, I will never be at peace with the doctrine of hell. In my human feeble mind, I'll never be at peace with how there can be a place where God will send people for eternal torture and torment. That's just, my mind can't 
And so we have the love of God, the glory of God in heaven, and we have the justice of God, which is defined as hell, where people who have never received his forgiveness and redemption, where they go for the rest of their lives in, and suffer in torment. So here's the reality. Here's the catch. Just because, I, just because I don't have peace with it and I don't understand it and can't totally, doesn't mean I don't teach it. Doesn't mean I don't accept it as truth. That's what the Bible says. That's all I can do. I can do nothing more. There's a tension that exists there. Now you might say to me, well, thanks, Pastor. How do I handle this, that tension? How do I handle that struggle? How do we handle it? Well, we handle it in part by faith. We handle it in part by getting into the messy middle of things, that tension that doesn't make sense. We handle it by going to the scriptures. Here are some scriptures that might give you comfort. The secret things, put it on the screen for you here. The secret things, Deuteronomy 29, 29, belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God was very clear about some things. In the Bible, God's very clear about some things. Very clear about sin, very clear about salvation, very clear about the gospel, very clear about the resurrection. There are things, we don't understand them all, but he's very clear, and we know what they are and how they work. And God can be very clear sometimes. There are some things we don't understand how that works. And we, we want to... We kind of step back and say no I can't believe in that because because my mind can't handle it that's not a good enough reason there's a tension that exists there and so God reveals things to us and other things he wants us to just simply take by faith and so what does hell look like in the end one day God will work that all out and and his goodness and his justice will come together and it'll be what it will be and um, I don't have to Understand it. I just have to teach whatever the Bible says. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. God's mindset is so much higher than mine. The reason we struggle is we want to capture the fullness and the wisdom and the glory and the splendor and the knowledge of God. We want to capture it in our own mind and we just can't. Our feeble minds just cannot grasp Everything God is. He is far bigger. He is far more complex. He is, in many ways, far more complicated than we can even begin to fathom. In some things, he's very simple. In some things, it's very complex. How about this tension? We don't like the truth and the tension. How about the tension between the goodness of God versus the suffering of man? Heard a story this week, Louis Giglio, past, uh, pastor of Passion City Church in, uh, down, I think it's Atlanta, Georgia. And he does all, they do all those passion uh, conferences and, and music. And he was telling the story a year ago, I looked it up online, a year ago there was a 19-year-old girl, uh, Christina. She was with four other, three other girls, or four of them killed. One of them survived the crash. And... Um, her family went to his church and he did the funeral service. He said it was amazing. Unlike anything he had seen, the church was packed and there were like a thousand people outside the building that couldn't get in. And the service went on for like three hours. So the service starts out and they start the service out playing that, uh, that, that chorus, Good, Good Father. Maybe you know the song. We sing it here sometimes. You're a good, good father. And so they play that and they go through this service. It's a three-hour service and all kinds of people sharing about this young girl's life and how amazing her testimony was and how God had used her to bless so many people. He said it was just an amazing thing. And they get to the end of it and they're getting ready where they're going to take the casket and go down the middle and and, and take it out. And so the family stands and, you you know, you go through and you shake their hand and and they they say goodbye to the casket one last time and, and it goes out. And so the family stood there and the person playing the piano, a friend who was playing the piano, was playing this song again, Good, Good Father. And he's playing it and singing it. And um, expecting this will take a minute or two. And, but it, it took a lot longer than a minute or two. And the family stood there and they stood there and it went on and went on for like 10 minutes. And so the person's playing this song and it's like he runs out of the song. You know, that might be Evan. You know, you run out of the song. What do I do now? Well, I go back to the beginning again, you know, and you play it some more. And he, he starts playing it instrumentally and not singing. And, and uh, as he goes on and on and on playing... 
He said, Louis Giglio standing there and all of a sudden it hits him. They get, to the, they get to the bridge of the song, Good, Good Father. You know what the bridge of the song of Good, Good Father is? You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your, your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Those are the words. And he said he's standing there and he's, and, and he's looking at the family. He's seeing one thing with his eyes. He's seeing the family. He's seeing the casket. He's seeing the pain. And with his ear, he, here he's hearing something, a dissonance that is entirely different. He's hearing, you're a good, good father. You're a good, good father. You're a good, good father. And he stood there and it just so grabbed a hold of him in that moment because it's like he's seeing one thing and he's hearing something entirely different. And it took him a while, he said, before he could process it all through the gospel and, and he could say, yes, you are, you are a good, good father. Even in this moment, you're a good, good father. There is a tension that exists between the goodness of God and the suffering of man or the pain of man that we endure in this world. And we don't always like, the truth is hard because there is a tension that exists there. And that's that's one of the parts, again, of that messy middle we have to help people navigate and help people get past. And then finally, we think about this tension that exists in truth and grace. How about the truth of God versus the grace of God? That messy middle, how, how do we navigate that? Again, many resolve this tension by going to one extreme or the other. Some Christians become judgmental and condemning and God's word becomes a destructive force in someone's life. Other Christians become accepting and condoning and God's word loses all power and authority. First John, I love this, or John 3.16. We all know John 3.16. Boy, 17 is so powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. The truth did not come into the world to condemn the world. You know why? You know why? The world was already condemned. Jesus didn't need to come and condemn anybody. They were already condemned and dead in their sins. And so Christ came to bring hope and to, and to bring life. And, and, and part of finding hope in life it involves the uncompromising truth. Some people don't like that messy middle. They don't like, and so they go to the extreme of being judgmental and condemning. And then other people go to the other extreme. They accept and condone any behavior And that doesn't work either. If I take the Bible and I ignore the parts of the Bible that are hard or are offensive or even condemning, what I do is I I emasculate the gospel. If I take the offensive parts out of the Bible, you know what I do? I take the gospel out of the Bible. What good does that do? The gospel is all about Christ's victory over sin, how he defeated death and sin and Satan and hell. So I don't need to be afraid of the uncompromising truth. I need to let people know that the truth, you know what the truth is? God has given you victory over your sin. He has redeemed you at Calvary. You can receive his forgiveness and you can live in it every day. Is the tension between, between truth and grace, is it messy? Yes, it is. Yet we are called to live in that same place that Christ did, square in the middle of truth and grace. There's a tension in God's truth and we always want to resolve it, but we, always, we can't necessarily always do so. How about this? How about another reason looking at, at why um, it is so hard not to compromise the truth? It's because God's truth, specifically the gospel, is offensive. It just is. And I've kind of been hinting at this all day, but it just is. Was Jesus' life ever controversial? Yes, it was. Was Jesus ever offensive? Yes, He was. You see, on one hand, the religious leaders hated him because he spoke words that convicted them. He spoke with such authority and they knew he spoke with authority and they knew his words convicted them and they just hated him for it. And at the same time, they hated him because he went and he he hung out with such controversial and sinful people. Mary, demon-possessed. Matthew, the tax collector prostitutes and drunkards and those uncouth fishermen and he hung out with them and he made them you know part of his team and and so they they really struggled that was the life of christ 
he did offend them. Now, I'm not saying that everything we, should, we do should be controversial. And I'm not saying it should be our goal to offend people. It shouldn't be our goal to offend people. But the reality is we are supposed to share the gospel, and the gospel is offensive. First Peter 2, 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him in Christ will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Jesus offended people. They stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. We're offended by the truth when we don't receive it. We're offended by the truth when we don't receive it. Romans 9, 33, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Note the contrast there. Some are not put to shame. Others are offended by Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the word of the cross, the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing, but to, those, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, I share this because there is a tendency today to want to take the offense out of the gospel and you simply can't do that. You take the offense out of the gospel, you compromise the gospel. Jesus never tried to take the offense out of the gospel. He spoke the truth and the fact is the truth is powerful because you know what? The truth can set us free. John 8, 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want you to think about, just look at Jesus' ministry a minute, look at it closely and here's what you're gonna see. You will see those he spoke to who got the truth, who understood the truth and you know what? They were set free. You can see it repeatedly in scripture. Go through and find the people that got the truth and came and worshiped him and were set free and find the other people who didn't get the truth, they didn't get it. They were offended by it. And that's the reality of Jesus' ministry, the truth. It offended some, it set others free. What does the truth do for you? I love this. Timothy Keller writes, he talks about the gift that makes you swallow your pride. He writes, Christmas is about receiving presents, but consider how challenging it is to receive certain kinds of gifts. Some gifts by their very nature make you swallow your pride. Imagine opening a present on Christmas morning from a friend and it's a dieting book. Then you take off another ribbon and wrapper and you find it is another book from another friend overcoming selfishness. If you say to them, thank you so much, You are in a sense admitting, for indeed, I am overweight and obnoxious. In other words, some gifts are hard to receive because to do so is to admit you have flaws and weaknesses and you need help. Perhaps on some occasion you have had a friend who figured out you were in financial trouble and came to you and offered a large sum of money to get you out of your predicament. If that has ever happened to you, you probably found that to receive that gift meant to swallow your pride. There has never been a gift, listen, never been a gift offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do so. Christmas means that we are so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God himself could save us. That means you are not somebody who can pull yourself together and live a moral and good life. You see, the truth can be offensive, but the truth can also set you free. Truth can set you free. And finally, why is the truth so difficult Why is it so hard not to compromise it? Because the truth takes us out of our comfort zone. The truth takes us out of our comfort zone. If if you want to think, there's a great contrast in the scripture between God's truth and the world's culture. It simply is. And probably the best way to understand the contrast between God's truth and the world's culture is to think of it through the issue of light and darkness. There is the glory of God's light. And then there is the darkness. And just think about God's truth as a light for just a moment. And and here's what God's truth does. God's truth as a light reveals things about the glory of God, doesn't it? God's truth as a light reveals his glory to us. You know know what else the light of God does? Anybody? Light of God reveals the glory of God to us. What else does the light do? It reveals our sin. It shines into the darkness. It exposes the darkness. That's right. 
The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John 3. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. There is a clash between God's truth and the world's culture. It's the clash between light and darkness and the light shines in the darkness and exposes it and the darkness repeals. The darkness doesn't like it. The religious people didn't like Christ because the light simply walked into the darkness and exposed their hearts and they did not like that now here is where it gets personal and here's where it gets uncomfortable for you and me because you know what here's what the Bible says about the light do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world this is why it is so difficult sometimes to not compromise the truth and it, it, it takes us out of our comfort zone because we're the light. and We go into the darkness and we shine the light in the darkness and that's very uncomfortable. In fact, look at that passage again and you've got to read the next verse. Notice it says, it says there, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Look down here, verse 16. How do we do that? Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ they may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Holding fast to the word of ice. Not compromising the truth. That's how we shine the light into the world today. And that's going to be a very, at times, uncomfortable thing to do. God's truth will take us out of our comfort zone. So here's what you need to know about truth this morning. Here's what we looked at. Truth, the, the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Truth is a person, Jesus Christ. The world has traded the truth for a lie. And number four, it is hard not to compromise the truth. And we looked at several reasons why that is. Let me take you to one last thing you need to know this morning about the truth. In fact, let me start here. I think I have a couple of verses in uh, Colossians 4, 5, I believe. Colossians 4, 5, I'll read them here. Walk in wisdom, it says, towards outsiders in Colossians 4, 5. Making the best use of the time, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Here's my last point that you need to know today. We should never add to the offense of the gospel. Yes, the gospel's offensive. And, and just telling, the, speaking the truth will be offensive at times. We should never add to the, the offense of the gospel. And there's the verses I just read. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you know how to answer every single person. First Peter 3.15, Peter's saying, be ready to always tell people why you have hope in Christ. And then he says, do it with gentleness and respect. May we never add to the offense of the gospel. Is the church a safe space? In many ways, no. We have, to, we have to tell the truth as the truth is. But then in some ways, the church can be a safe space, a place that people can come and we will treat them gently and respectfully and we'll share the truth with them lovingly. That's the reality. One person said it, uh, one person said it this way, the gospel is offensive those that share it should not be. The gospel is offensive. Those that share it should not be. Let me give you three goals here as we wrap up here today. One goal is this. One goal is this. Let no one's answer when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to their inability to receive the gospel, Let no one's answer be, well, I didn't receive Christ because I was offended by the church or I was offended by somebody. If the gospel offends somebody, that's one thing. If I offend somebody personally, that's an entirely different. May it be my goal, may it be our goal that we never offend anyone personally with our words and our actions apart from the gospel. 
You know, it's, it's interesting. Many will claim that they didn't come to Christ because they were hurt by the church or they stopped going to church or they were offended by somebody's uh, actions or somebody's words. You very seldom hear someone say, I didn't become a Christian because I was offended by the gospel. There's a difference there. I don't know if I've ever ever heard anyone say, I rejected Christianity because the gospel offended me. But sometimes people offend. A second goal would be this. You know, I was thinking about this, that we are, John says, we're to be known by our love. We're to be known by our love. I think that's a pretty powerful thing to stop and just think about. You will... Know us as Christians by our love for God and our love for each other. We're to be known for our love, not for our offensive words, even if they are the truth. We're to be known for our love, not our wisdom, not our impatience, not our politics, not our religion, not merely our righteousness, not even our truth. We're to be known for our love. Christ was known for his love, but he spoke the truth. And then finally, how about this? As Christians, if we have the word of God available to us and the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us, why can we not aspire to do the same things that Christ did? We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Why can we not go out into this world and reach out to this world in the same way that Christ did with both truth and with both grace? Let's pray, and then we'll look at a video here. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your truth, that you tell us the truth, that you don't sugarcoat it, you just tell us straightforward how it is. And yet, thank you for your incredible grace, your, your incredible patience, your long-suffering, your mercy, your love, that you reach out to us wherever we are, with open arms. Lord, help us to be just like Christ. Help us to be full of grace and full of truth. Help us navigate that messy middle, that that messy place between our church, being a church of truth and being a church of grace. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and credit as you work that out in our life every single day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. Father, thank you. I pray you'll bless everyone as we head out today. Give us a great week. Go with us today. Wrap us up in your tender, loving arms, in your grace and your mercy. Protect us. Bless us. um, And we'll gather together again next Sunday in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.